Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Semaphore Uncut, a podcast for developers about building great products. In this new episode, Darko, the podcast host, welcomes veteran tester Maret Puhayarvi. Maret shares her thoughts on the role of testers, how they can provide the right kind of feedback to developers, and how to navigate the nuances of different architectures and documentation practices. I hope you enjoy this new episode and let's dive in. Marit, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Darko. Uh, great. Uh, can you please just go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, I've been uh, in the industry uh, for 26 years now. I've been working with testing and quality related things pretty much all of my career. I've had various testing titles from test, uh, test manager, test researcher, then moving over to management side and then back to testing titles and then again back to management titles. Currently, I am leading a 20-person development team in, in Vaisala. Semaphore has released the Flaky Test Dashboard to help you identify unreliable tests in your project. Identify which tests disrupt your pipeline and cost you the most, all in one place. Go to semaphoreci.com slash product slash flaky dash tests dash dashboard to find out more. For us, not really familiar with testing as a, as a discipline. Can you give us your, let's say, definition and introduction to the discipline? We come into this industry that grows very, very heavily with different kinds of backgrounds. Some people get their first assignment as in kind of you're writing test automation. You're going to write BDD scenarios first, and only then you will do application features. You might not call yourself a tester at that point, but if your you know, center of your work is that you spend time really thinking about how you capture things in tests, you are somewhat of a tester. Then uh, other people like myself, we end up in this this industry by kind of, you know, paying first attention to the domain, uh, what kind of things the customers are really expecting and, you know, talk more to the customers and make sure that they're getting whatever they wanted. So some people end up uh, from that perspective. It's not always evident uh, of, of who's a great tester and who's not. I have had this this basic experience of kind of like, you know, trying to myself recruit testers into my development teams. And a lot of testers are too commodity, kind of like following developers doing exactly what the developers were already doing and not adding value. Whereas other testers, the ones that I'm looking for, and again, I've been trying to find the right words to explain this, they really add value in those teams. So, so again, it's not just testers, it's the right kind of testers we would need. For for the teams that generally um, lived, you know, and, and still live without, you know, a dedicated test testing team, um, there is always that moment of hiring the, you know, the, the, the first person within the team. And I know a, a lot of our customers who are also like a, a, a teams of like couple of couple of dozen of engineers that, you know, some don't have like a testing team or testing person or some are just, you know, thinking of establishing. And um, let me mention one other thing that I have been seeing is, uh, is somewhat of a trend. Uh, our interface towards, uh, towards a lot of uh, companies are developer productivity, developer quality, you know, uh, developer productivity and quality teams or developer experience teams. And they end up being uh, connected to the quality also a lot of time. Um, so just wanted to, to, to mention that as, uh, you know, quality and testing are, you know, uh, sometimes more connected depending on the company. They're definitely connected. And like, I've been changing jobs every two, three years. So I have had a chance of seeing a lot of different kinds of companies, including ones where there were no testers before me. And thinking back, kind of like one of those where I joined, there were 20 developers in the organization and I joined as the first testing specialist. Uh, I definitely knew that there was a risk uh, that the developers would expect me to do all things they recognize as testing. And that doesn't help with the quality. Like if you throw it, you know, to someone else, kind of like thought you already knew what you're supposed to do. And now someone else comes and, and you know, they're specializing in doing that. You no longer have to. That's usually not a good thing. 
So I needed to kind of like from day one, I needed to address the fact that, you know, I didn't come to do the testing that you're already doing. That remains. There was testing you were not doing that I came here to do. I established somewhat of a reputation with that particular team by, you know, they had this, this, well, they were following this metric of, of how many of the logins uh, would end up in, in a visible error message. Kind of like a user logs in, how often will they see an error message? And they knew that they had 18%. Like there was a clear, you know, very visible, measurable gap of what they could know because they didn't know why the users were seeing this. I couldn't touch the software for the first year without seeing these big visible error messages coming from everywhere. And it was funny because the developers could see them too as soon as I sat next to a developer. And then we needed to figure out kind of how to change the whole, you know, CI related practices in that team. Uh, they had some unit tests and, you know, some basic tests there, but not enough for the developer's perspective. They had a project manager who was insisting that you need to test on the end to end level, which is not where you get there, you know, the, the immediate feedback, like we are, you know, looking for in, in the modern world. So, uh, one of the things that I needed to do as, as a tester or test specialist in that team is to say, we don't hire more testers. We invest more time in that unit testing that we knew that we needed. So, it might be that you really need to uh, look for the, the right kind of feedback rather than just, you know, insist on a certain role or a certain uh, person to join that team. I remember speaking with some people in the, in the, in the testing world um, who are advocating for that, you know, holistic approach to testing of that, you know, hands-on work with the team and, you know, looking from very, you know, different perspectives and actually enha- enhancing the communication and, uh, you know, critical thinking with, within the team. Um, would you classify your work that you did that as, as, as that kind of approach? Or uh, Definitely it is, is that uh, I use the word uh, contemporary exploratory testing, mm-hmm. very similar to what some people would call holistic testing. Like it seems like we, we like different words. The yeah. usual reason why I call it contemporary exploratory testing is that we were doing this kind of, of very smart, very hands-on style of testing already back in 80s in Silicon Valley, like that was already reported back there. But there's many things that have changed since, for example, this whole automation as documentation, automation as something that enables you to do things during your workday that you couldn't otherwise do. And it would be silly to say that exploratory testing is somehow manual and, and doesn't take into account the, you know, the realistic CICD pipeline-based work that we have in pretty much any of the teams that are successful these days. So uh, that's why I've called it contemporary, that I've been looking for the patterns that really enable us to work together very closely as a team. And and TDD, the way that I think of it, it's just, you know, exploratory testing on a unit level. You really need to learn to express that intent and and think in, in multiple dimensions. I finished my university like in 2008. Kind of have a very, had a very, very limited experience with creating something which gets packaged and shipped and should, you know, work 100%. I usually had the ability to deploy on the daily level, you know, into production and fix something, you know, al- along the way. Then I, I also met people who like in 80s and 90s did actually a lot of work on creating the software, which is going to be packaged, burned on the CD and put on the shelves, which has a very different criteria and very different culture towards, you know, the quality and, you know, uh, r- just the rigorous approach of making sure that, you know, it really works on a, some, you know, h- higher level. Um, a- any thoughts on, on, on that, you know, those two different patterns of software being shipped? I think there must be more than, than just those two patterns. Uh, kind of, uh, if you ship software uh, to a user base where they are, rarely using your software. You probably get the chance of going and fixing it before anyone notices it. Mm -hmm. But if you have a few million users, uh, probably 50% of them will suffer before you notice your mistake. So you actually, even in the the faster cycles of things, you have that uh, rigorousness of, of what kind of problems you cannot let go through. Even, even without the, the whole uh, CD related uh, uh, trouble as well. Uh, 
we used to do a lot of bespoke, kind of like, you know, built tailor-made software where you had access to the production environments already back in the, in the 80s, I think. Uh, kind of like it was on your own server and, and not yeah. all of it was kind of like shipped with a, a CD. So I don't think the CD and, and that stuff changed the world so much, mm-hmm. but it definitely introduced, at, you know, something at some point introduced this idea of uh, uh, we would rather only deliver once and not bother anyone more than once a year when we give the the latest and greatest version. And I would imagine that's much more of kind of like how we think about uh, products and, and convenience for the users rather than the, the technical aspects of, of how we deliver. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and you're compl- completely right. Um, but also, I think uh, there's this weird idea that somehow people think that if we deliver less frequently, it's somehow giving us the, the rigorousness, like we have the time to do the rigorousness. But actually, we have time to take more risks. That's my experience. It's the opposite. So if you made a mistake, you know, even if 50% of those millions will see that mistake, if you can, you know, revert in five minutes, yeah. it's a short thing that happened. And, and we are really working with the customers to change this, this idea of how often can they install and why would they want to install. Modern JavaScript uh, isn't really a, a something that you don't uh, update uh, frequently. You, you do have to. And yeah. actually, all, even the older technologies, you would have wanted to if you understood security-related considerations at all. But uh, there's a lot of, of belief systems where Moving slower feels like you are safer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually, it means that you just move uh, further away and increase your risks. Yeah, yeah. And in the realm of um, patterns that, uh, that that we use to build the software, um, I mean, one of the relatively re- recent elements that, that came to underst- our industry is this concept of microservices and so on and being able to ship independently. Um, from your perspective, the perspective of your discipline, is there like a, 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 a difference in how, you know, teams approach things and in terms of testing and, you know, the quality which is being achieved or it's not really something that changes things a lot? Uh, it changes things in the sense that uh, for microservices, you really have to understand APIs and be able to work with smaller pieces with an API. So the conceptual thinking uh, for testing that you would do uh, changes. It also makes it somewhat, I think, uh, easier if and when you have the the, the technical understanding of, of you know, services mm-hmm. type of things. It makes it somewhat easier when you're not trying to guess on uh, end-to-end level what might be the impacts. You can actually, well, I'm, I'm a big fan of infra, uh, uh, infrastructure as code, not necessarily as the tools in that space, but the idea that nothing in your test environment ever changes without something changes it's changing in the text files. Like if you get to that level of, of transparency, of change, you can actually analyze the change and make better guesses of, of what might be, be impacted. Obviously, level of automation, kind of like having that for every uh, uh, interface, but also having that across interfaces so that you know and you get the, the feedback. I, I was speaking with someone recently who actually worked in at, at Apple in um, early, early 90s. And uh, uh, he explained to me how a uh, testing group was like a whole and it was like a big team on, on its own and the change that they saw that he, they saw actually is that the, that team was cut down into slices and those you know testers were sent around the, the organization to join the development teams and uh, he was explaining that that moment of um, testers you know kind of developers becoming a, a boss bosses or you know managers of testers and how that actually really hurt their their craft and, and their discipline are your experience uh, is you know uh, confirming that the similar uh, patterns uh, i see the similar pattern of breaking down the testing groups and having testers and developers work together in the same groups 
uh, obviously, um, I don't see the testers suffering from having developers as their managers because, you know, the developers might then be suffering having testers as their managers. There's, you know, equal representation of both kind of, of managers in, in this sense. So again, management, uh, both product owners and, and development managers or engineering managers, they definitely can hurt the, the testing culture a lot. But they can also promote the testing culture a lot. They can maybe, you know, bring the bridges of you don't listen to this person or, or you're dismissing the work of this person. Maybe we should, you know, all work together as a team, like as if we are investing in having both kinds of people in the teams. And we are usually investing. Maybe we should take care of, you know, both kinds of people with equal rigor or, or care. Yeah. Yeah. You have to choose the kind of the virtual aspect and then the the real kind of teamwork aspect and i find personally that testers can usually bring the the virtual aspect of like we collaborate across the tester role in the whole organization easier than that they can bridge the we are in a different group than the developers so i would definitely not go back so i see that pattern Mm -hmm. that we've broken them and i think that's the pattern that i am driving Semaphore has released the Flaky Test Dashboard to help you identify unreliable tests in your project. Identify which tests disrupt your pipeline and cost you the most, all in one place. Go to semaphoreci.com slash product slash flaky dash tests dash dashboard to find out more. One thing that I saw in one of your recent talks when you... um, Uh, I think that you were trying to solve how you introduce what you do and, you know, what was the role of tester. And you use a very interesting term that, that I really like, you know, um, feedback fairy. <laughs> yeah, that whole feedback fairy term, it came from a, a um, conference where someone who wasn't a tester or a developer was asking me, what do I do for work? And I said, I'm a tester. And, and I was like, I don't understand what that means. Explain it to me like I'm five. And in the moment, I, I, I just, you know, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know. And later on, like next night, like middle of the night, I wake up and I realize I should have said I'm a feedback <laughs> fail. You know, like I come with the gift of feedback, you know, with yeah. a smile on my face, kind of with, you know, actual care on how people will receive the news, but also remembering that some of the feedback is positive. Like it's not only the bad news that your baby is ugly. It's also the, you know, the great news that, that it's actually, you know, looks like things are improving. Things are better today. Like maybe if you remember things two weeks ago, they were, you know, not in, in the shape that, that we have things uh, as of today. Yes. Yeah. The whole center of a, a tester's job generally is, is kind of like look, go looking for feedback. It's about the product and it's, it's quality. It's about the organization. Sometimes it's the people's patience. It's the communication patterns that you're testing and, and, and giving feedback on and, and trying to do it in a way where, you know, you're looking for things that don't quite work, but you're trying to somehow spin it in a, in a positive collaborative way. One thing that uh, generally engineers and developers don't like to do very much is documentation. Do do you see from your experience a, a way that um, you know testers can improve that 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 line of work? Some of the reasons why we don't like documentation is that when we read it, it's not so useful after all. We haven't quite cracked the 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 secret of what is it useful what is useful to write down for future. Usually it's something that we didn't write down. Uh, We write too much, which means then that there's a cost of reading all of that. And we way too often write it too early when we know less than what we would know by the time we have developed things. So with me, the, the thing, the way that I have kind of learned to think about this through testing is that we should document when we know the most. So testing, you know, test cases or, or automation cases in particular, it should be an output rather than an input. Like even mm-hmm. BDD is kind of saying, you know, you have the test cases first and then you implement according to those test cases. Sure. Yes. Let's do that. But let's make sure that everything we learned while we were doing things gets captured in that documentation too. Paying attention to who's reading stuff and what's useful uh, is, is, a, is a big part of it. Uh, what are they needing and are they really needing it or are they asking it out of habit? While you were explaining this, like documentation being, you know, written too early, uh, 
I, I, I can relate to that. And that, that drove me to asking a, a question about, um, you know, generally customer support and connecting that to the, to, to the support team because that's kind of, um, that's a really high quality feedback, you know. Uh, it can be high quality feedback. Uh, I have direct mm-hmm. okay. access to all of the emails that the customers send over to us. And from a development point of view, I wouldn't call it high quality feedback. It's mm-hmm. a high uh, noise to, to uh, real information ratio. But okay. when there's information, that is really, really valuable. Clear, clear, clear. Uh, distance between the development team and the support team uh, often means that the support team doesn't know when the development team would be, you know, having the power of actually changing the user's experience. So we've really needed to build these bridges where we, you know, read that stuff together and and pick up the the important things. And surprisingly, many questions are about. Uh, uh, I'm not reading the documentation. I don't even know where to get started. That type of, of questions. So. I, I yeah. don't think that's a high quality feedback, but that's it is clear. something that a lot of products will will face. Yeah, yeah. And maybe a question relates to that. Um, a- any thoughts of like uh, mixing the documentation with the user interface? Games are really good at leveling this kind of information, whereas the the office type of apps are really bad at leveling. Mm-hmm. And and again, assessing where are you in in your need of leveling. I would like to see more documentation built into the applications, but then again, like way too often it happens that we don't build the usability of the application, which is Mm -hmm. kind of like we put the documentation as a secondary layer when we didn't do the usability related work. Uh, But yeah, there's definitely good ways and and not so good ways of of, of doing that. Uh, I'm often overwhelmed with too much information. But I'm also, as a person, like I'm also overwhelmed with uh, going into a training that actually teaches me what buttons to press. I haven't needed that level of teaching for for years. But I can appreciate that there are users who will actually want and will need that. Because you are too native to the the domain and, uh, you know, it just speaks to you. Almost like a tester trade that the software whispers to me, it speaks to mm. me. So yeah. it's made me a particular brand of a little crazy in in the <laughs> sense that I hear like it's you know it's saying that I can press these buttons and I can trust that the buttons you know you know if I break something because I I press those buttons, there's probably a way for me to recover from from those as well. For the for the teams that don't have yet you know have anyone you know in the in the testing role. Um, how would you, how would you do recommend that that f- first person is, you know, searched for what, what, what should the teams look in that, you know, first tester within their teams and maybe connected to that a little bit, uh, what's a piece of advice that you would give for the, you know, testing people in, in leveling up their careers. So the next step, there is usually, a, I, I suspect a pattern that you see and that you would really want to, to convey that message to those people and that. Ideally, they would, they would hear the advice. I, I look for three things in, in the first and even in the second uh, testers. I look for someone who knows how to program. I would not hire a tester who doesn't either know or want to learn to program anymore. Like That's definitely a, a cornerstone. You can't read code. You can't get the, the information if you don't want or can't get to that. Then I look for someone who knows and wants to learn the domain, kind of like connecting things from the domain so that we recognize the gap between what the users want and expect and the stakeholders in general want and expect and do the research in that space and then bring it back to the team. And then the third thing that I look for is is uh, collaboration, kind of like, you know, being able to talk about this stuff with people who probably have a different background. Than, than you do yourself. So uh, a lot of times I find only either the programming or the domain in the same person. And mm-hmm. I usually find that I can teach programming easier than the domain thinking. So mm-hmm. I usually welcome someone who doesn't know yet how to program, but I teach them the basics. Test-related programming and test-related code reading is simpler than the general yeah. application programming is. 
but on the collaboration, if you don't have that kind of like, you know, initiative of, you know, yeah. daring to speak about all of this stuff that you're uncertain of, I don't think that can be really fixed. So, so I yeah. usually try to look for, for these. And again, uh, same way uh, when I'm looking for the next steps in leveling, you can level so much in the domain and, and learning about the application and seeing problems. Like a lot of people who call themselves testers these days, they actually don't know how to test really well. But also I would look for someone who wants to learn that automation. Like it is really not an option to say that, that uh, we wouldn't be part of that world at all. For people that just want to, you know, learn more about testing, learn more about you, what are the best ways to to follow you and your work? Um, I write uh, public notes all the time on Mastodon. So that's the, the definite best way to uh, see what I'm thinking and what I'm doing and what I'm writing. Uh, mm-hmm. The second level of, of the things that I write uh, usually goes into my blog. And the third level is LinkedIn. Uh, I select things that I feel like are something that I feel like are ready and, and, and meant for wider audiences. So I would go, go there. And in LinkedIn, I also share articles that I have posted. Uh, thank you so much for talking with us. Hey, thanks for having me. What a great conversation. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Make sure to subscribe to Semaphore Uncut on your podcast player of choice so that you don't miss our new episodes. And stay tuned. 